This week on Dialogue, Truth, Errors, and Lies, Politics and Economics in a Volatile World. Hello and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. I'm John Molusky. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Our guest this week is Jagash Kowatko. Mr. Kowatko is one of the world's leading thinkers on economics and development policy and was a key architect of Poland's successful economic reforms when he served as the country's deputy prime minister and minister of finance. He's currently a professor at Kosminski University, where he heads the think tank TIGER, which stands for Transformation, Integration, and Globalization Economic Research. His latest book is the one we'll be discussing today, Truth, Errors, and Lies. Greg, thanks for joining us and welcome to the program. Thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. Uh, let me start with uh, the idea. I, I should say up front to our viewers and listeners that this book is so full of ideas and full of big ideas that we could not possibly do justice to it in 30 minutes, but we'll see what we can cover in the time that we have uh, together. And, and I want to start off with uh, the idea behind the title. This isn't just a title that's disconnected from the work. Well, that's a good point, you know, to start with because the book has been published in several languages, and actually in each language there is a different title. The original title, which I was looking for for some time, is hardly translatable for English language. The proxy would be word on the move or cruising word or wandering word. But after certain debate, there was the proposition of the publisher, Columbia University Press, why not to derive the title from the first chapter of the book? There is 10 of them, and I think that the most important one is the last chapter, number 10, about uncertain future, the most extensive one. But the first chapter is called The Words and the Word, where the truth, errors, and lies came from and how to deal with them in our life. I asked myself the question, why if some of us, social scientists, policymakers, intellectualists are wrong. What happens? They are not right. Why some of them are wrong and why some of them are lying? Because unfortunately, not only in politics, where it happens much more often than in intellectual debates, people which are wrong are not wrong because they are mistaken, they are committing an error, an intellectual error, but simply because they are lying, either for the purpose of ideologically driven motivation or because of representing a lobbying for certain special group of interests. Or maybe foolish pride. They just don't um, want to be wrong. Well, it's also some kind, sometimes a case for uh, of psychological. If one is wrong pretty long time, say about interest rate policy or about influence of taxation for economic growth, and then one is hardly keen to admit I was wrong. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Have you seen on TV, on prime time, any economist or policymaker who said, oh, I'm sorry, guys, you know, folks, I was wrong. It is completely different. I was lobbying for that group of interest. No, therefore, everybody is saying I was right. And we, the economists, we, the social scientists, most of the time, all of us, we are saying that we are right, yet we are telling different stories to the people. So I asked myself, or I was asked by somebody, a question which seemed at the beginning a trivial one. I published a lot including 10 books in English, uh, also here in the United States, where I had the privilege to teach at certain universities from Yale to UCLA. I asked some person I do respect what I should write next. Another book on economic growth, another book on globalization, another book on post-communist uh, transformation or transatlantic relations. And the person said to me, you know what, professor? You do answer the people the question, why it is as it is. It sounded trivial, banal. But then I came to the conclusion, this is the most challenging issue I'm facing in my life. Why it is as it is. Therefore, where? From what perspective? According to what values? To what axiology? Uh, in what period of time? And I started to answer the question in a very scholarly way, but to 
attempting to expose it in understandable way. It's my duty as an as a intellectual leader, as a scholar, as an author, to think in a structured, model, theoretical, scientific manner. But to speak and to teach and to write, it's supposed to be as simple as possible, but not simpler. So I have started to draft the book answering the question, how we have come to the current stage of the world, civilization, global economy, culture, polity, environment, and especially what are the feedback, what are the relations, say, between technology and environment, between culture and politics, between society and economy. And then I discovered another interesting challenge, I think, that an economist is not in a position to answer the simple question, why the things are as they seem to look. It must be eclectic, it must be interdisciplinary. The great Einstein used to say, the thinking has a big future. I'm proving in my book that the interdisciplinary thinking has the great future. I want to get back to this notion of uh, making the book accessible, the approach you took, because you talk about the problem with truth, errors, and lies, one of the things that can break down. In the first case, truth is someone knows the truth, but they're not effective in their communication of the truth. And so you have been conscious of that, and you're trying to write this book in a way that's accessible if a person isn't an economist. Well, you know, uh, I may, I may um, keep that I'm a double face economist because we have the descriptive economics, mm -hmm. which is answering the question, how do things work? How it happens that if this is the cause, this is the mechanism, something happens here. Say income is going too fast up, therefore the prices are following and this is raising inflation. The cause, the mechanism, the result. But if you know how the things work, then you have to show another piece of your face that is the normative or postulative approach. Okay, you know how the things work. Now tell us how to change the things for better. And being at a certain period of time in a very interesting place of the world in Poland during the post-communist transformation, I was rather critical to this contemporary laissez-faire approach to making the transformation. But always I'm positive. I'm a positive economist, I'm a positive thinker. I'm not just exercising criticism, I'm proposing the alternative if I think that something is wrong for the mankind, for America, for progressive people or for my country, etc. So I was invited to join the government and then I found that it is a completely different story. To be a scholar or intellectualist, it is enough to have a rationale uh, good arguments to convince the readers, the listeners, the students in the classroom. But if you go to the politics, to be right is not enough. You need majority if we are working within the democracy. And we do. We do. In the United States for a couple of hundreds of years, in my country of, for a couple of decades, and in some emerging democracies just for a couple of weeks. So you have to find the way to convince the majority, not only in the parliament, because sometimes it is more important and much more difficult to get the majority of the society. It's another trick to have majority on the hills, on the Capitol Hill, or in Polish Parliament, or is it whatever, Britain, Japan, or even country like China and Russia where the political scene works differently. And it is another trick to have it set in motion. So it is not enough to be right. And my approach is uh, multifaceted because I'm not only university or academia professor who know, wants to know how the things work. I'm really keen to make my small contribution as much as I can to changing the world for better. And this is different logic, you know, you have to think and you have to act in a different way than you are doing at the Wilson Center or Kosminski University or is it Yale or UCLA or Romanosov University in Moscow or Tsinghua in, in Beijing. Politics is based on different reasoning than economics. And then I do travel. I've been to, I explored almost 150 countries from the bottom of the earth, you know, somewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia or Latin America, Caribbean, all the post-communist countries. I've been to almost 50 US states. So I do know the life. And traveling is comparing. So to write such a book, you have to be the university professor who knows a little bit on economics, political science, sociology, history, anthropology, futurology, etc., interdisciplinary. So my approach is within the triangle 
which I think is good advice for everybody to analyze what is going around in the county, in the state, in the country, in America, in our interdependent world. This is the triangle to which I refer as the triangle of development, and one point is given by policy and politics, another one by institutions in the behavioral meaning, that is the rules of the game. This is the regulation or, if you wish, re-regulation or deregulation. And the third is the value. So don't blame all the responsibility, for instance, for the crisis or the public debt or unemployment for the policymakers. Is it White House or Treasury Department or American Congress or whatever government in Eastern or Western Europe or elsewhere? We can solve certain problems within the policy, policy uh, using the policy instruments, but this is within the framework of regulation of institutions. Starting from the Constitution, there is the rule of the law. The show, which is called globalization, economic development in the long run, supposed to be run by the law, not by just the people which somehow are being affected by wishful thinking. But even if you have the proper institutions, which we do not have, we have to re-regulate American economy, we have to re-regulate the global economy. We do re-regulate our emerging markets, that is what all transition is about, and I've been four times Deputy Prime Minister in my Polish government in a wonderful country, which is of the successful story, so I know a little bit about that. But then you have the values, and if there is a quest for better future, I'm trying to give a positive proposition, but it can be done also if there is also certain restructuring shift of the value. And here in the United States also, there is now a time of re rethinking and redesigning the famous American values. Just keep going and continuing as it used to be in all the good days is simply invisible in the future. We have to adjust the politics and policies within the institutions which must be also reinstitutionalized and changed me, and the values must also shift a little bit. Let me uh, talk about another a barrier to the kind of progress that you're suggesting that you identify in the book which is uh, media and that a lot of this uh, conversation takes part. Here's something you wrote specifically. Public debate and its instrument, the media, constitute a two-edged sword. On the one hand, it is impossible to pass the torch of knowledge to a wider audience without them. Exactly. On the other, they enable demagogues and liars to reach the same audience, which leads to a lot of this irrational thinking you identify. You call it trusted nons nonsense, falsehoods, pseudoscience, myth, and demagogy. Uh, what, what is the problem with media both in the United States and in the rest of the world in, in having a, a reasonable discussion, a rational well, discussion. I think, and I'm not saying so because now I'm for a while, uh, because the, uh, the book has been published in the United States, that the American media are not that bad as the media in very many other countries. I think that it would, would be quite good if the media were uh, as, say, rational, honest, uh, responsible and accountable in the other parts of the world as they are in the United States. But I'm not that naive to take, you know, uh, as granted everything what you say in media is a TV prime time or leading a newspaper. I'm giving plenty of examples from different aspects of um, politics, economic policy, international relations where the media were manipulating, are manipulating public opinion, or being, are being used by the political players or special group of interest to act not on the public behalf, pro publico bono, but on the behalf of certain group of special uh, interests. So if we are engaged in ideological confrontation, I wouldn't say class of civilization, I'm not a follower of class of civilization, my vision and my proposition, my plan for the world is rather global melting pot, where we can learn a lot from the positive history of the United States. You are so great country and nation because you succeeded with this melting pot of the last two or three centuries, and now if I'm taking a look for maybe not as long as two or three centuries forward, but say two or three generations forward, I think that there is the chance for continuing globalization and integration based on global planetary melting pot. But there is also the conflict of economic interests. It must be 
a sheer naiveness, you know, to believe that everybody is acting on the uh, behalf of the general public and mutual interests, etc. So don't expect from an economist that I will go to the primetime TV show and I will say, you know what, guys, let's cut the taxation for us and if we will pay less of taxation, then there will be more money uh, circulated in the economy and it will raise entrepreneurship and it will bring the water up and everybody will be employed. So the lower I pay taxation, the higher is the employment. I know some colleagues which are arguing in this way and I do know that they don't, that they know that they are telling untruth. So they are lying, they are not wrong. Because if they are wrong, I may be also wrong. I'm listening to your arguments. You may say, you know what, Greg, you didn't take this piece of theory into consideration. You have omitted, you have, you have missed this data. You didn't take a look into the experience of Brazil or positive or, say, Nigeria negative from last decade, how to manage the equitable growth, etc., etc. Aha, then now I see that I was wrong. I'm revising my train of thought. But when I'm a lobbyist, you know, I'm being paid or I'm ideologically driven to tell you something so with, what I know it's not true. With that in mind, where do you turn for reliable, untainted information? Well, uh, this is the difficult question. This is the difficult, uh, this is the difficult question because uh, intelligent reasoning must be relying or interpretation of the proper data. So my definition of rationality is that a rational is somebody. It can be an individual or it can be the American nation or it can be the mankind who is acting or on his or her behalf considering the information. Critical, presuming that all of us, we are intelligent, aren't we? So we know what is good for us. At least we believe that we know what is good for us. But sometimes somebody else is saying that something different is good for us. One definition, by the way, of the good sound policy is to deliver to the people what they need, not what they want. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting point, point that, yes, sometimes people want what is not most important from the or long -term good for us. interest. So how you are trying to convince the people in democracy that what they want is not what they're supposed to uh, be in quest for because we know better what they need, etc. But going back to your square one, to answer your uh, question, I have a special mechanism of looking for information which I know are indispensable if my ability to analyze, but I have the capacity. I'm the man of science. I know how the things work and I'm sharing in a simple way my train of thought in my readers. But most of the people, they are lost, they are confused, they are turning to the prime time TV news or the newspaper or they start the day with switching on computer and browsing the internet and there is such jazz uh, of m information and misinformation and they are confused. The American president once time, some, some time ago, Hoover, is believed to said, where is the one-handed economist? Because always he heard, you know, Mr. President, on the one hand, that it is. On the other hand, <laughs> this is it. He said, gee, bring me one-handed economist. <laughs> Well, I know that there are very many aspects of the same issues, but one has to be very careful, at least, upon what information we make our decisions. Because each decision to save or to spend, to invest in treasury bonds or on stock exchange, to keep in US dollars or maybe in euro, to study or to go to work, to retire or to keep working, each, this is each of it. This is an economic decision and sometimes we are listening, aha, if we will give our money to this hedge fund, it will be multiplying pretty fast. Is it information or manipulation? P pretty often the market was manipulated. It was not, people found it now, especially where here in the US that they were manipulated and a lot, a lion's share of this manipulation was organized and was going through the through the media. So my now, my reading on the, of the media now with my experience from the politics is very careful. I'm rather monitoring the media, but when I talk to the people, I write the book and I ask, do read it. It, I, it is eye-opener, you will understand a lot. So, but even if you are selling thousands of, ta of, of copies of the book, how many people you can meet in person? Mm -hmm. I'm meeting a lot of the person. I'm now touring the America, plenty of universities, I'm answering the people live. But in the contemporary world, it is not ancient Greece. I'm also 
showing how it was in ancient Greece. That was the direct democracy. Now we have to talk with each other through the media. You are invited me, which I appreciate very much. You are asking the question to deliver the message to our TV audience. And a, and a big part of your message is a criticism of what you call neoliberalism. So it's let me ask you uh, yes. first to just briefly define neoliberalism and then tell me what's the problem as you see it as applied to economics and politics? Well, on American ground, maybe mm, mm, what is easy to understand, this is the concept of so-called contemporary laissez-faire. That is the Let naive, the market do its that work. That is naive belief that the government is public enemy number one. Mm -hmm. The less of the government, the less of regulation, the less of intervention, the better. And the market will do the job. The market is able to solve certain problems. But markets also create some problems, and then we do need the intervention. So I'm telling that the recipe for better future is it China, which is a different story, or is it US, which is a different story, is a synergy as a positive synergy of the power of invisible hand of market and the power of the visible brain mind of the government. You write, we need economic freedom and a strong state. Uh, to many politicians in this town, those sound like contradictions. <sighs> I'm a little bit afraid of this word strong uh, state or government, I would say efficient, working. So I was never an advocate or fan of this uh, slogan, the government is not the solution, the government is the problem. The government is, government is neither the solution nor the problem. It depends. We have, for instance, pretty good, not bad, government in Sweden, in Finland, in Scandinavian democracies. Sometimes we did have better or worse government in Poland or in the United States. But we do need the government because we do need the regulation, because we do need the supervision of certain market spontaneity, and otherwise the things can get out of control and then became nasty. But be careful. I can give you, and I'm given plenty of, plenty of examples from different parts of the world where we have, where we have nasty government. And then why you say, I would say the less the government of that type, say corrupted or bureaucratized, the better. So going back to your uh, question and the answer, what is neoliberalism or this contemporary laissez-faire is, it is also a bias of liberalism. My train of thought, my axiology, my proposition for the world is do rely on liberal values freedom, uh, market, private property, entrepreneurship, competitiveness, free choice, free media. That is, these are the institutions. These are the values we must try to build the better future for us and for the next generations, disregarding where we are, in Washington or in Beijing, in Kuala Lumpur or in Rio de Janeiro, etc. But this contemporary laissez-faire or neoliberalism is manipulating these values for the purpose of enriching the few at the cost of many. What you can see pretty clearly uh, in a country like, say, Russia, especially in the 90s, but still in the last decade, and I would say over the last 20, 30 years since so-called Reaganomics in the United States or Thatcherism in Great Britain, where the fruits of the growing economy which was in turn the fruit of growing labor productivity, competitiveness, technological and managerial progress were not shared in a shared in, in equitable way. They were taken over. The cream was taken over by rather small part of the richer part of the society at the cost of many by manipulating the markets, by so-called financial innovations, that is some derivative instruments which were introduced for the purpose of redistribution of the wealth and taking over of the growing overall income, uh, not on the behalf of the majority of the uh, people. And actually, if you would ask, ask the question, which you may, as one of the next on your schedule, uh, what is the basic or primary cause of the contemporary financial and economic crisis. I would say this is this uh, version, this uh, type of contemporary laissez-faire well, or neoliberalism. It's interesting. You use the word redistribution uh, about moving the money upward to the few. In this country, often that term is used when people attempt to spread the wealth more uh, liberally around to a, a greater pe group of people. <sighs> that is another challenging issue because, well, well you might ask the question, okay, globalization according to my interpretation of globalization, is it good or bad for development? Is it true that there is less of inequality in the contemporary world than, say, a generation ago? 
Well, if we compare average income in Mexico with average income in U.S. or average income in Poland with average income in Germany, which is a richer country, we are closing the gap. There is the process of catching up because average income in Mexico or in Poland is growing faster than, say, in the U.S. or in Germany. But if you will take into account 310 million Americans and 110, say, million Mexicans, and you have the population of 420 million Mexicano Americanos, okay, the income distribution is more and more unequal. And the, uh, therefore, if you are taking a look into the world, and here you see how we can manipulate the public opinion. You are inviting uh, this thing which economists through your talk show, and you are asking, Professor, is globalization contributing to inequality or equitable growth? One well, can prove, well, it is decreasing inequality because income in developing countries, emerging market, is growing faster. True? True. But the other true, which is the really the, 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 the better true, uh, the true truth is that if we take a look into the global society, the mankind, the income inequality is growing uh, because within the countries the income inequality is growing, including such different countries with such different values, institutions and policy, policies like US and China, like Russia and Poland. With all the differences in all of these countries, the income inequality is growing. So one way economists, no liberal economists or a lover, fan of la laissez-faire would say, this is the rule of the game, this is objective. No, it is not. It's a matter of val values, of priorities, of policy and policy choice. To give just one example to conclude, we over the last 10 30 years left. inequality in Brazil has declined and at the same time the entrepreneurship and competitiveness in Brazil was mushrooming. You can combine more equitable growth, which is good for most of the people, with support for private driven entrepreneurship, which is actually the driving force behind economic growth. If you know how you do it and if you are designing properly each three points, that is politics, institutions and values. Greg, thank you very much. As I, as I told our viewers and listeners before we began our discussion that there, this book is so chock full of ideas that we could barely scratch the surface. We have scratched the surface, but I would recommend to you if you'd like to uh, learn more to check out this book. It, it is, uh, has a wealth of information, provocative and uh, useful ideas, and some hope for the future. Thank you. We'll return next week with another edition of Dialogue. Until then, for all of us at the Wilson Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Radio and Television. Our host Twitter feed is twitter.com slash John Malevsky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast cable, satellite, and telco on MHZ Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhznetworks.org.